I'm Stephanie Herbstritt. Um, I'm a graduate student at the U of I. I work with Dr. Cook. He's my advisor. So uh, I guess I'm the one who's hired to do all of his work. <laughs> um, and this is Annie. She's a senior undergraduate. And we've been working on a project um, that, that deals with implementing filters into tile drain systems to reduce the risk of surface water contamination um, for use whenever you're applying liquid manure. Um, so this is what we're trying to prevent. Um, you know, obviously liquid manure is a valuable source of nutrients. And um, we, I guess we all know that uh, there's this potential for it to move through these macro pores, um, wormholes and root channels to surface waters. And, and there are a lot of um, management practices that producers already um, use to prevent this, um, but we think that a filter would be an added um, level of risk reduction. So I guess the main concerns with what is flowing from the field through the tiles to surface waters would be nutrients, uh, organic matter, bacteria, and antibiotics. But in our group um, at the University of Illinois, we focus strictly on nutrients, um, nitrogen, and phosphorus, um, particularly. So this is just a map from um, Mark David, who we do a lot of work with, just showing uh, this extensive amount of nitrate loss um, in the Mississippi River Basin, where we are at the U of I. Um, and you know, obviously, this is a concern because this is a driver for eutrophic waters and um, the hypoxic zone in the Gulf. Uh, and then again, just to give you a spatial idea of the amount of loading of these nutrients in this intensively farmed region of the upper Midwest, um, this is another map from Mark David just showing on a kilogram per hectare basis uh, the amount of phosphorus moving through that system. So, sorry, I'm a little nervous. Um, so to get into this, um, a lot of things are already done uh, to prevent the risk associated with applying liquid animal manure to tile drain systems. So you don't apply if it's, if, if it's going to rain, if your soil is saturated, um, if, if you do have manure-laden flow, you capture the effluent, um, you monitor subsurface uh, drainage outlets. A lot of people use shallow tillage. Um, and, you know, these are great. Um, but at the same time, we know that with weather and the soil system, it's so complex that sometimes you, uh, you know, you can't account for everything. And having something at the end of your tile um, might be an extra level of, of protection for you as a producer. So um, in Illinois, we have started to use drainage control structures more um, and inline tile stops to reduce this risk of a discharge. And we kind of feel that the use of these inflow and outflow structures for drainage management practices provide ready-made receptacles for filters. So the idea is, um, I just have an agri-drain structure up here, but the idea is to turn these gates or logs um, into a filter that you would change in and out uh, maybe twice a year if you're doing fall and spring application. Um, so this is our initial prototype. Um, we initially started this project trying to force this filter to just fit into these agri-drain uh, gates that Dr. Cook had us working with, but we quickly realized that it's challenging um, to design a filter that can handle high flows um, in tile drainage. So we increased the depth, um, and we're, we're um, undertaking this ongoing process of testing the filter with um, low flow rates, high flow rates, um, varying retention times, and uh, we're trying to get an idea of how it does work. But that's not really the only application of this filter. We also do a lot of work with um, subsurface fire reactors at the Uni University of Illinois. Um, so we're, we're kind of also investigating the idea of using these um, in order to approve how efficient these bioreactors are. So I'm going to turn it over to Annie, and she can talk a little bit about that. Oh, yeah. on the left is our initial prototype filter 
That's a view from the top looking down through the control structure. Um, the diagram next to it kind of shows it from the side. So how it works is the water flows in and kind of builds up on the influent side and then will slowly um, drain like through your filter to the other side and then leave the structure. Um, so we're testing different flow rates varying from 0 to um, 0.5 cubic feet per second because those are commonly found with tile drainage. Um, so we're just looking at kind of a big range and how it builds up. So what we're measuring is the head and then we're going to relate that to the known flow rates that we're testing. Um, so this is the relationship that we've started to come up with. Um, so one of our biggest challenges has been to design a filter that lets your water flow through, um, you know, at an effective rate, but still allows for enough contact time with the filter medium um, to help clean your water, which is what you're looking for. Um, right now, we are just using activated carbon as our filter medium. Um, in the future, we want to explore different options. Um, phosphor absorbing materials is something we want to look at. Um, so our main goal is going to be really to look at nutrient removal, but right now we're just um, using activated carbon. Um, so we're in the process of setting up different experiments in our lab and at the farm on uni at University of Illinois. Um, we plan to run these various tests for different flow rates and retention times with a spiked influent um, or with certain concentrations of manure and kind of look at how that affects the different water quality in the effluent. Um, so then we'll sample the effluent for nitrate to see how well the filter works for nitrate, nitrate removal. Um, we're also in the process of working with local farmers to try to find a field where we can test their, with their um, crops and with their manure application. So Stephanie kind of mentioned part of this project was originally based on the subsurface bioreactors. Um, it's shown in the picture. The one on the right is one that was placed, uh, is built this fall. So the diagram next to it is kind of just the whole diagram of the whole system. So what we're looking into doing is implementing our filter within the bioreactor. So this is kind of a picture of the bioreactor from the top, um, and our filter potentially could go at the influent stream or at the effluent, and potentially it could end up replacing the phosphorus removal chamber. Um, that's why we also want to look into removing nitrates and other nutrients in addition to phosphorus so that it could just be more effective overall. Um, we're also looking into the effects of treating for mercury. Um, a lot of times with the bioreactors, there is an unintended consequence of mer mercury methylization. So that's also something we would like to look into with our research. Um, so the animation isn't working. But basically, um, through the bioreactor, the water comes in through the red arrows on the side and goes across the structure down to this gray pipe on the other side, and then it goes back across and out the drainage structure. So um, what we're looking for is implementing our filter to use with this bioreactor, but also um, as a standalone filter in a controlled drainage structure. We think that, I guess um, that reason, that three. by not having it in a big so bioreactor, which are pretty expensive and use a lot of land and you need a lot of resources kind of to set them up and it's pretty expensive about five thousand dollars so we're hoping to keep our filter costs low and affordable for farmers because of its size we think this is very applicable um, we definitely still need to do a cost analysis and life cycle testing to see how long our filter would be able to last for but we think um, also using it and we think that it has the potential to be a really good filter in control drainage structures in addition to bioreactors. Um, it's pretty small. It's just like a little box right now. Yeah. Right. And ideally, it could be implemented in your drainage control structures that are already existing, which is why we think it has so much potential to be a good option. Um, so
So we've had a lot of help, um, Dr. Richard Cook and Laura, who's here today. She's helping us um, get a farm for testing. Um, but really, we just want to um, answer your guys' questions and kind of get your input and recommendations and ideas for how we can improve our project in the future. Yeah, I think that's probably the biggest challenge that we're facing um, is, I'll repeat the question. Um, so the question was, do I think, or do we think that um, the amount of flow going through these tiles, um, say for like a larger field that's 40, 80, you know, 100 acres, uh, is going to be too great for the filter to handle? And I think that's definitely our biggest challenge right now. Um, the, you know, we don't want the filter to hinder that movement of water because obviously we don't want ponding in the fields. Um, we don't want these tiles to get backed up. But I, I think um, there's going to be a trade-off between um, you're going to have to allow for a little bit of ponding to still get that increased water quality. But our, our focus is definitely to try to capture those peak flow events off of medium-sized fields. We're probably thinking 30 Okay, so yeah, sorry if we weren't clear about that. So the the filter um, has two applications. So when just implemented into the drainage control structures, we're strictly looking at nitrate removal. I can't recall what Jeff just as an added pick up half the bill. Or are we splitting in thirds? Management practice to reduce that risk of liquid animal manure reaching the, yeah, the surface water. Yeah, so um, so we would have hopefully receipt. effectively treat the, bill. the water. Um, as far as phosphorus, that application would just be used in the bioreactors okay, because um, you you know, the bioreactor's right. main purpose is denitrification. We're getting rid of the nitrates. So um, he, he's my advisor, Dr. Okay. Cook, well, is really interested with, um, ask him or should I try you know, later? trying to increase their efficiency and increase what they can actually do. So right well, now he has um, phosphorus is, is removal office, chambers office, in um, one bioreactor. Um, it was the thesis project of another student, okay. and so, um, we're kind of looking to replace those with tomorrow? maybe a filter. Um, and okay, then in I'm addition to that, we're, we're kind of having, okay, thank you for my we're, we're doing research right now where we're taking samples to try to determine if uh, the methylization of mercury is an issue, um, and if it is, we would we would hope to address that with the filter as well. Yeah. So right now we're thinking that it would be used for one or two applications. You probably have a new filter every year, um, but. We still have not done a lifetime um, analysis. Our, our research has kind of been put off because um, our access to our pond, which is like the water we use in our testing, has been frozen all winter. Um, and we haven't found a field site yet. But hopefully, um, in the next few months, we'll start collecting data and have a better idea of how long these last. Oh, this is what you're doing. That's your right 